what an impact he's had on America. He's been uh, consulting uh, for the nation's leading top consumer companies like uh, Disney and others. Uh, but he, you probably know him from uh, seeing him on uh, television, uh, Sunday morning programs and others as one of the top political commentators in the country. And why is he top political co commentator? It's because he asks great questions. And in a time of rapid change, one of the things we need and need to honor is people who've really got courageous curiosity. And this person certainly uh, has that. He's an award-winning author. Uh, he's won an Emmy for his television work. He's got a PhD from Oxford. Uh, and he's here this morning. I think this is going to be an engaging uh, 30 minutes. Uh, some of you may have read his books, uh, Words That Work, uh, was a bestseller. Uh, I think one of the fascinating things that came out of that was we learned that 75% um, of Americans were against uh, no, 75% of Americans were for estate taxes. 75% of Americans were against death taxes. It's the same thing. Uh, <laughs> words make a difference in our society. Uh, and this guy has uh, he's got a new book out about what Americans really want, really. Uh, and he may understand more about what America's thinking and feeling and in their psyche than any other person. So uh, it's a great honor that's he here today. He was with the mayors in Miami yesterday. He's going to be with legislators uh, tomorrow. He's uh, passionately going around the country because he believes uh, that this is a challenging time for our country. And what we need is uh, compromise, cooperation, and bipartisanship. So a timely time to have that message and uh, someone who's got some great uh, in things to share with us. And I'm not sure why you've got someone else's name tag on, uh, but maybe you'll, uh, maybe you'll explain that to us. But anyway, give it up for Dr. Luntz Thank right you. here. So people were coming up to me. The reason why I have someone else's name tag on is that people were coming up to me yesterday. And the most common comment they say to me, including two of you, was you must be having a great time. With all that's going on in Washington, this must be the time of your life. It sucks. <laughs> you know, I'm a pollster. My job is to ask questions. My job is to listen. And so I figured for people who didn't, couldn't put the name and the face together that I would wear someone else's name tag so less people would come up and I'd have to explain how bad it is. Here's the problem. I don't know who Dennis Chalker is, but some of you really hate him. So I will take this off, but you don't have to, whatever he did to you, you don't have to spit on him or anything. Uh, this, I'm grateful for the invitation to be here. And, and Governor, um, you have an important role to play, all of you do, in what happens in Washington. And I promised if you invited me up here that this would be 85 to 90 percent new, which it will be. One joke is the same, but it's because I actually got a chance I do a bunch of jokes, like Mitch McConnell went through eight hours of open heart surgery because it took him six hours just to find his heart. <laughs> or did you ever notice that John Kerry looks just like the tree that threw apples at Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz? <laughs> uh, that George W. Bush was an amazing president and a great communicator when you consider English was only his second language. And so I do a bunch of those. And I got to do my favorite one to him, to Bill Clinton, because he spoke at the mayor's conference. And he added something to it. We interviewed 1,000 women. And we asked them, would you have relations with Bill Clinton if you could? 21% said never again. <laughs> so he looked at me without a beat and said, that's a lie. It's only 16%. You know, I miss that. So the first thing I want to do with you is I want to bring it home to you. I want you to feel the anger out there. We did a segment for 60 minutes, and it broke my heart. And you'll actually see in the middle of it, I walked off. And I went to the executive producer, Jeff Fager, and I said, I can't do this. I failed that this country has become so divided. I, I want you to feel what I feel. I want you to see what I see. I want you to experience what I experience. So please... Cue that tape. I'm going to show you how bad it's become in America. And then I'm going to walk you through um, infrastructure, health care, and education to help you solve the problems that have been created that's out there. Please, let's roll the tape. We asked Republican pollster, public opinion analyst, and CBS News consultant Frank Luntz if he could put faces and voices to this dark national mood by scientifically selecting a focus group that would reflect those polling results. And he did. 
Some members leaned towards Trump, some leaned towards Clinton, some were uncommitted, and most of them had an unfavorable opinion of both presidential candidates. So let's do a vote, let's do a vote. How many of you are voting for your candidate? Raise your hands. Three, how many of you are voting against a candidate? Everybody else. Lentz has conducted hundreds of these focus groups during the campaign with registered voters all over the country. And everywhere he's been, he's heard pretty much the same thing. I want you to describe how you feel about this political process with the election only hours away. I want you to give me a word or phrase. Terrified. It's rigged. Exasperating. Circus. Disturbed. Horrifying. Disheartened. Annoyed. Disgusted. This is horrible. But Luntz was much less concerned about the negativity than he was about the tenor of the discussion. He wasn't in government. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 Lots of people are going to be But it doesn't yeah. matter. So if they disagree with you, their opinion shouldn't matter. That's I didn't say it didn't matter. matter. I didn't say they shouldn't have, no, have a right to say anything. People who support Donald no. Trump shouldn't talk to them. No. 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 Yes, no. so I didn't say that they don't have the right to. No, 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 no. It took two minutes for them to explode. It took five minutes to actually get to the point where I lost control. I don't want to misunderstand Stop, but that's not what I Stop. Okay. And that's why election night is everything. Stop. I want to know what those two candidates are going to say. Stop. Please, your words have power. Find words that unite. Stop. You're as bad as they are. <laughs> uh, it was, and let's go to the PowerPoint. It, it was, it broke my heart. And I'm good at this. I know how to get people engaged, and I know how to calm them down. And we're out of control. And as bad as that was, it is worse today. And you're the only people, you are the only people that the Americans have any kind of faith and trust in. So some of you don't know me for that long. You do, and you do. And I've never kissed up, ever. And by the way, who the hell bought you that shirt? <laughs> you know, divorce lawyers would be a lot cheaper than that shirt. It's nice to see that Stevie Wonder buys your clothing. Uh, I know. So the first lady knows why I wear these shoes. Over the last four or five years, as I've become increasingly despondent, I have discovered, it's one of the reasons why I moved to Las Vegas, as you know. He's actually my governor right there. My favorite word in the English language is buffet. It is the only thing that makes me happy. And the problem is I've gained a considerable amount of weight. And people will come up to me who know me. Do not take notes about this. This is off the record, Carl. <laughs> and they'll point at me and they'll say, Frank, what the hell? And I realized that if I got shoes that were very colorful, they would walk up to me and say, geez, Frank, you got, oh, my God, look at those shoes. <laughs> this is literally why I began this whole shoe collection. You are the solution. You're about to become the head of the NGA. We don't trust Washington, and I promise not to repeat myself from the session that we had in private. We don't trust Washington. We don't trust Congress. We don't trust the federal government. We still have faith in governors. And there's a bipartisan... Okay, let's try that again. We still have faith in governors. So I'm going to walk you through how you can get even more faith, how you can drive even more support that is bipartisan. And I want to start with one last comment about the election, then we can move on. Look at what it does to people running for office. Look at what it does to people who are elected. These are just eight years, and this last one was in a single year. Bernie Sanders is so old, the only time he doesn't have to pee is when he's peeing. So, so I've now hit every politician there is. 
actually, no, there is one last one. Bernie Sanders knocked on 100 doors in a single day trying to find the last undecided voters. Hillary Clinton knocked on the same 100 doors. She was just trying to find Bill. <laughs> now I've hit everybody. I want to do infrastructure first because it is a requirement of the governors. We are discussing the largest investment in infrastructure. I'm not sure how it's going to work out, and I want to give you the language and messaging to understand where the public stands. First, for those of you, and I know we got a lot of people here who are arguing for infrastructure, this is the one issue in America that absolutely connects Republicans, Democrats, and independents, and you start there. It is unifying. It is uh, uh, almost universal in support. And no matter what state you're in, whether you're in Montana or Arizona, people care. Second, is that they trust you, not Washington, to determine which roads, which bridges, which highways. They trust you with schools and energy and wastewater and all of that. They want you to make the decisions because they don't trust the decisions come from Washington. Third, and I'm a language guy, it is crumbling. And when you communicate crumbling, that communicates what they see every day and how they drive and how they experience it. Fourth, is that you have to instill a sense of accountability because it's what they don't trust when government handles this. And the reason why is that they'll be driving on a highway that's being rebuilt and there'll be 20 workmen on that highway and they'll see 15 standing around and five will be digging. And they look at that and they say to themselves, and that's not accountability. They want to know their money is going to be well spent. And fifth, they want it now. They don't want to wait. And they expect you to deliver it for them. So overall, to show you the importance of it, we gave a list of 15, and these are the top five quality of life changes on the state and local level. And number one, and you can see Republican, Independent, and Democrat. It beats prices they pay for gas. It beats fuel efficiency. It beats... Uh, 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 renewables and clean energy. It is the number one change to quality of life that the American people want. And I always do this because there always is a cost. So we ask nationwide, would you be willing to pay one cent more? And by the way, the numbers for the West, 76%. Almost what it is nationwide. We're telling them that it's not for free. You're going to have to pay more and they're willing to do it. There's a huge caveat. And by the way, I didn't have a chance to do this with the mayors. We have enough time that if you want to ask me a question, feel free to do so. 76% of Western states uh, are willing to pay one cent more per dollar in taxes and sales taxes if it will actually make a difference in terms of infrastructure. Here's the problem. We don't talk about who it's for and we don't talk about the benefits. And it's not that you're going to build roads to help people get from point A to point B. It's to help people get from point A to point B, comma, we're going to build roads. To ensure that our students get educated in modern school buildings, comma, we're going to. Of all the things I'll say to you today, remember this one. It's not what you do that affects them. It's what they need, comma, therefore I will do. You start with them first. It's one of the reasons why Congress is so hated. They are horrific communicators. They really are. And they don't understand that the public sees life from their own perspective, not from the perspective of government. For retirees, it'll give you better services. You need to personalize and humanize infrastructure because the word itself is horrible. It means nothing. And when you talk about roads, bridges, highways, schools, wastewater, energy infrastructure, Wi-Fi, all of these, you need to mention them. There's also another word that comes in that's very powerful, which is you deserve. Sometimes governors don't want to do this because they don't want to raise expectations, but you deserve is your own commitment to them. And I think that every one of you, regardless of Democrat or Republican, believe that you will improve the quality of life of the people you serve in the time that you serve them. And by telling them they deserve, that is a personal commit, excuse me, commitment from you to them and you then link infrastructure. Now, I want to show you accountability because, again, talking to a couple of you over the last 24 hours, I keep hearing shovel ready. Nobody, nobody believes that anymore. Uh, Obama said it. Biden said it. It's simply not credible. And they're not looking for speed. They're looking to ensure that their tax dollars are spent wisely and effectively. 
So these are the six principles behind improvement of infrastructure, and one comes in first clearly, and that's the accountability, and by the way, it's on time and on budget. That's the definition of accountability. So often you all talk about transparency. Nobody knows what transparency means. It's not a common aspect of our lexicon unless you're a businessman. And even measurable results, which you will see is a very powerful phrase, it's half as important as accountability. So for you all in the audience who's trying to get them to build something, rebuild something, construct something, create something, you need to show these governors that what you are going to do is absolutely the definition of accountability. And the second half of that is that it will have an impact on a stronger, healthier economy, which everybody wants, no matter what state you're in. In fact, it crushes everything. You've heard me talk about quality of life or the future. A strong, healthy economy, and it's not economic growth. Economic growth is what academics and economists talk about. A healthy economy, healthy schools, healthy neighborhoods, healthy, fill in the blank, healthy, is what the public is looking for. Two more here. I know this is a lot of words, but I actually wanted to give you the phrases and the words if, that if you agree with this, that I've started your speech for you. We've talked about efficient, effective, and accountable. I want to go to the bottom. That it's smart and strategic, and that it tr you truly get what you pay for. The language on the right is a governor not from this state. Uh, is a governor from an industrial Midwestern state. We took a whole bunch of statements that governors made. The language on the right truly resonates. The language on the left does not. Sorry, the language on the left resonates. The language on the right does not. And one of the reasons, easily traversed highways. What the heck is traversed? How many of you in this room know the meaning of the word traversed? You're lying. It, again, people just don't talk that way. And this is the last one. And once again, I tried to provide for you, and I want to point out the measurements of success. Cleaner, safer, healthier communities. You all talk about sustainability. Here's the problem. Sustainability is the status quo. Sustainability means I'll be able to visit that lake. I'll be able to hike that mountain just as I am now. Status quo. Clean-er, safe-er, healthy-er is about improvement. And I urge you to be on the side of doing better rather than status quo. Last thing on this is that you have to speak visually. And you'll see this coming up with uh, the stuff I'm going to show in education. But people see the idea I want, as you communicate. When you are building something, people see something coming off the ground and they see improvement. When you're moving forward, they actually, as part of infrastructure, they feel it. So the language and the visuals should be about a better future. So I will, so that's infrastructure. Anything I can answer for you there? Okay, I'm going to move on now to education. Yes, sir. I can't hear you over your shirt. Frank. <laughs> Get some sunglasses. Uh, Frank, uh, Idaho is a very conservative state. In 1972, when I first became governor, my first term, I started asking for more money for highways because uh, it's a dedicated fund. It comes from the uh, tax on gasoline and registration uh, cost for a vehicle, and, uh, and it's not enough. And we've had task force after task force tell us it wasn't enough. But one of the things that I couldn't get the conservatives to understand uh, until two years ago, uh, when I changed, in fact, you helped me with that, with my state of the state, uh, was that all you conservatives talk about Washington, D.C., and their deficit spending and their deficit spending. Deferred maintenance is deficit spending. If we don't repair the roads today, your kids are going to have to do it, and it's going to cost them a lot more. But until we did that, and you made that point to me, until we did that, we couldn't get any more money. We have now, two years in a row, got more money for highways in Idaho. And in a sense, you either pay now or you pay twice as much tomorrow. Yes, Governor. Did you say you're governor in 1972? <laughs> I was six years old. <laughs> Did I say you first became governor in 72? Oh, 07. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> My, <laughs> All right, I'm feeling better. <laughs> so he, he, was, he was 72. Okay, so, 
So I'm, based on that comment, I'm going to change the focus now to retirement issues and language. <laughs> this is good because, Jim, this will be the last time I'm ever invited to this group right now. So education. It is not education reform. Stop saying it. And there's so many people that are out here that you do energy issues, you do insurance issues, you do financial services. Who's here that's advocating for schools and for students? Raise your hands. Five of you? That's what depresses me. Because this is going to affect everything in this room. And when you talk about education reform, as everyone seems to do, all it communicates is that you want to change education. It is not personalized, it is not individualized, and it is not humanized. And that's why only 12% prioritize education reform, whereas 54%, sorry, 39% prioritize effective education for all. Effective, it's the E words, exceptional, extraordinary. It's great that education begins with an E. Think of the E's, and that's what stands up. In terms, and we did this, we broke this down by the West. We asked them, what are the priorities for education? And it isn't a 21st century approach or modernized. It's not about the future. It's actually back to the basics. Because they know how important it is for their kids to be able to read and write and talk, to be able to stand up at a meeting like this and be able to communicate without saying um and ah. Uh. Back to the basics is what they want because they think their kids aren't getting it. And in the Western region, it is the highest of anywhere across the country when it comes to speaking about the basics. I also hear, and I went through your State of the Union addresses because I basically have no life. And, I, and I, I admit I did not watch them because that's too painful, but I did read them because I'm looking for the language that you all used. And my offer to everyone in this room and a couple of you I've met with is I'll look at your stuff and I'll do a red line of it if you want me to. You guys talk about performing when what they really want is an effective school. So please change that language. Another example, which is always the issue of how much we're going to spend on education. So I asked it directly. And 31% are, are insisting on more money, but 62%, it's not how much we spend that matters, it's how we spend it. And I say it to every person here. It's not about quality, it's about quant. I did it again. It's not about quantity, it's about quality. And they are genuinely focused on what the outcome or what the result is as opposed to the process. And I'm afraid because often advocates come and they just want you to spend more. That's not what the public is looking for. I know these are a lot of words. If you guys give me your emails, I will send this stuff to you when this is all done. But these are the 13 phrases that we have found to be most impactful, and I'm going to do four of these. Number one, and number two, all children and every child. Every and all, is it communicates that you will not let any child fall behind, that you are truly dedicated to an effective education. It's not universal. It's every and all. I also want you to look at... Uh, Number nine, equipping students for the real world. Parents aren't looking for knowledge. They're looking to know that their kids will be able to write a check, knowing that their kids can handle simple math, knowing that their kids can think critically. Real world skills is what they are looking for right now. Number 12, recognize, are there any teachers in here? Okay, I just want to particularly for the two of you here, maybe I can make it up since you're mad at me over the clothing, <laughs> that teachers, you are God's gift to our communities, and we can't thank you enough for what you do. <laughs> Recognize, respect, reward, and retain, and it's not just language, it's real. And state after state has fights over pay, not merit pay, but pay for performance. I will tell you that pay per performance has greater than two to one support. And I know that's a big issue with the teachers community and some of you are not going to take this on, but the public wants you to. And they want you to because you're the only profession where the best aren't paid more than the worst. So I hope that someday you guys will challenge it. And then that last one, it's not how much we spend, it's how we spend it. So we can go back to that. 
Now, here are the definitions. When people talk about what they're looking in public schools, what they want, effective and then motivating and challenging. What they're looking for in terms of teachers, inspired, committed, and passionate. These are the definitions, this is the language that the public is looking for when you talk about each one of those six uh, uh, priorities when it comes to educating. And I want to em emphasize the one for students. Inspired is obvious, encouraged is obvious. It's challenged that is one that is so often left behind. They really want the kids, they really want you to raise those standards and make it tougher on them because parents and adults overall believe that if their kids are challenged, they'll be more successful. And I'll keep, I'm gonna go ahead on this. There's something called XQ Schools, it's Emerson Collective. I'm gonna make two plugs in this presentation and this is one of them. For those of you taking notes, Emerson Collective is putting millions and millions and millions of dollars into developing new schools, developing new high schools, a new way of learning. And they're doing this all across the country. If any of you want to seek to have them invest in one of your high schools to create something that's never been done before, I would love to help you do it. Because these are the most amazing high schools and the kids that are experiencing this, even the process of applying for a $10 million grant and they give away 10 of them a year. Even that process builds the most wonderful relationship between students and faculty and administrators looking for a better approach to our high schools so they don't look like a normal high school. And I encourage you to, to go on the web, learn about XQ Schools, and it's being sponsored by Emerson Collective, and this is the language behind it. That offered to you can put real money and a real change for students in your states. I also want to do images for you because there's no place for education where images are more powerful. Why is this image so powerful? And I'm going to start with the governor of North Dakota. You see this image here. This stands out more than anything we've tested. Well, why would you guess? And I'm going to go down the line. Uh, collaboration. Why would you guess? It's focused on the student. Why would you guess? Personal attention. Why would you guess? Individualized attention. Why would you guess? No, the, no, Jim, go ahead. Uh, engagement. And focus on the student one on one. Just like that. Connection. Mentoring. The number one reason? Go ahead. Yeah. Still no. That's it. It's a male teacher. Think about it. Think of how many single parent homes where there's no man in the family and how important it is to have some sort of male influence. Less so because most of you come from rural areas, but in a place like Las Vegas, there are communities where there isn't a man around. And to see a male teacher, particularly in that, as you say, that level of integration, that mentoring, that is so powerful. Don't do fake shit. <laughs> I don't know any other way to put it. <laughs> this absolutely isn't real. Everyone knows it's not real, and it doesn't communicate anything to anyone. And by the way, how many of you have, in the last 12 months, read to students? Raise your hands. If at some point in the last 12 months you've read to students, one, two, three, four of you. No. I want you to hand the book to the student and have them read to you. I want you to flip it around, just as I've been talking about the other stuff, all of this. Flip it around because when a student reads to you, everyone in the school knows it, which means every parent knows it. And the pride that a student feels when they can read to a governor, you guys are role models. You may not realize it, but they respect you. They don't respect their congressman or their senator. Do not put that out. Do not. Because <laughs> I'm going back to Washington, and I don't need that crap. I do not want to be audited. <laughs> you still have that perch of being something special to them. 
and for them to read to you is something they will never forget and something their parents will always appreciate. Third is the younger the student, the more important, the higher the priority. Once the kids get to high school, the feeling is whatever's going to happen is going to happen. They're done. But it's the younger kids where the priority, where the emphasis should be. This is a whole collection of some of the best visuals that we have tested. And you can see the same thing. There's reading there. There's collaboration there. There's joy there. There's interaction between teacher and student. All of this works. When you talk about education, don't do it from the governor's mansion. Don't do it from the Capitol. Please do it from a school like this. So people can feel it. That they feel that this is not a politician talking about education. This is a father or a mother. This is someone who, who lives it in everything that they do. A couple more here, and then we'll move to the last issue. Raising of hands is the way you demonstrate success. When a child's hand is up, it means they know the answer. And that says that the school is working. Having fathers, mothers and fathers, both of them engaged with their kids, impacts them. The worst thing a failed school more than anything else is what happens if you get a bad education or that girl with her head down on the book. Boredom is an example of failure. And if you have boredom in your schools, then those schools are not working. Anything, I'll do one question on education if you have it, and then we're going to do the last issue. Anyone on education? Okay, finally, health care. And I only added this because of what's about to happen, and I don't think the Senate's going to pass the legislation. I think this is going to be kicked into July, so you guys have a little more time to deal with it. Nobody wants a comprehensive bill. Nobody actually wants to replace Obamacare. And I say this, this is heresy. What they really want is for the system, health care, to be repaired. They're not looking for complete replace, and they want it done step by step because they already recognize what went wrong in the first way, in, in, the, in the legislation from seven years ago. So I'm allowed 30 words, and these are your 30 words for health care. We heard you, which is so much better than listening. Listening is passive. You all are listening here. If you're on your, like she's on her phone, if you're on the phone, though you may be taking notes, she, if you're on the phone, you are listening, but you don't hear. Hear is so much more powerful. Your mission, because that says that it's everything that you're about, a mission and commitment. No promises, no pledges. If I ever hear a governor say that, I will call you up and yell at you, and you'll hang up on me. But a promise and a pledge is what a politician says. A mission means it comes from your heart. The choice and control you want, the affordability you need, the quality you deserve. Choice, control, affordability, and quality, those are the attributes. Nobody cares about competition. They care about those four attributes, and you want, need, and deserve them. Don't ever say customize for health care. Who here is in the health care area? Raise your hands. If, if you say customize, that means you're looking at profits. Customize is a business term. They want it personalized. The thing that they hate the most, which no one in Washington is talking about, which means governors should be, the idea of bureaucracy. It's too bureaucratic, too much red tape, too many rules, too much regulation, too many things I need to read. And once again, the information you need, the options you want, and the control you deserve. The stuff on the right-hand side, I don't know, unleashes market forces? What the hell? <laughs> I don't want, if, in my lifetime, if something's unleashed, it bites me. <laughs> and forever, who's in this room who has that Doberman and you tell me it's a safe dog, that dog scares the crap out of me. Please take it out of the hotel. So I'm going to end with language for you. Uh, and this was done last night at 2 in the morning. So if there's a spelling error, you'll understand why. The Rhode Island Innovative Policy Lab, which is a ridiculous name for an organization, R-I-I-P-L. For those of you taking notes, before you do language, you need to do policy. This is the best organization I have ever seen in my 25 years in terms of the research that they do. They're going to be part of the NGA. I wanted to give you a head start because they're not that big and they can't do that many states. They have the best data of any organization. They have the best algorithms of any organization. They can show you if you have a job training plan, if you have a food stamp plan, if you have a Medicaid plan, they can show you what's working, what isn't, and why. 
you can make precise changes to policy and not only save money, which everyone's looking for, but actually improve the quality of services. Those guys, R-I-I-P-L, and you've got the uh, email there. I'm not a huggy, I'm not a touchy-feely person. So if you want to hug me when this is done, don't. <laughs> when the woman gave me the presentation for this, I got up and gave her a hug because I saw this as an answer. I saw this as a solution. These guys, this stuff really works. And this is how it works. I'll let you guys figure that out, but this organization is the best. Stop talking about jobs. They want careers. It's not that everyone wins. It's that everyone benefits. Everyone follows the rules. Everyone. You see that same thing. All and everyone. Do I have three more minutes? The language on the right is language that was spoken in at least one person's state of the state within the last 12 months. And the language on the left is at least two to one better based on research that we have done. Metrics is what you do at MIT. And I've never met a fun person from MIT. <laughs> Results is what they're looking for. Change is what Clinton talked about and Bush and Obama. What they really want is impact. They want genuine impact. Government mandates, which you all talk about. The average voter does not understand what a government mandate is, but they do understand what government rules and red tape are. So please move from mandates to rules and red tape. And if you don't, then at least you have to teach them that mandates are about rules and red tape. Another set. Nobody, it's amazing. Balancing the budget is process. What they really want is to end wasteful spending. And I've recommended that states conduct a forensic audit of their budget. It'll make it much more effective. Nobody cares what students teach. The question is, what do students learn? The stuff that you see on the right-hand side is stuff that is more theoretical and ideological. The language on the left side is the language of real-life Americans who are living their life every day. Pride. When you say, I'm proud, it comes across as arrogant. When you say, I respect, it comes across as genuine support. The word diversity has been so polarized. Uh, for those of you who come from large companies, diversity is politicized. Diversity is, I'll take one from this section here, one from that section, and one from up there. Inclusion is wrapping your arms. It's like a big hug. So many of you have diversity programs in your state governments. You should be having inclusion programs. Dreams, <coughs> other than the American dream, it's not real. Imagine is much more real. And I end on the new relationship because the public truly believes that you can make a difference. I'm hoping that you guys will do another resolution. I know you did it two years ago. And I'll even give you the language. And by the way, look at the support for state and local governments over the federal government in the Midwest and West, 7525. They support state and local governments. And this is your language I hope you'll consider. A resolution to change the way America lives. It is a privilege to present to you. I want to empower you. I will volunteer my time for you. You have people out here who will do anything for you because you are the last best hope for millions of Americans. Thank you guys very much. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Governor Otter suggests that we all go and give uh, Dr. Lawrence a group hug. Uh, <laughs> you know, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lawrence. Uh, I, I, I told you this was going to be a fantastic day, and that was a great start. We so appreciate you. Um, and, I'm, and I'm so glad that Dr. Lawrence talked about impact, uh, because I can assure you, really without fear of any contradiction, that no group of bipartisan elected officials is producing and pursuing important public policy at the breadth and, and the substantive depth of Western governors. Now, you know and you've learned